Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Eric Varnes. Good afternoon. Nice to be back at Imperial College this year in a different lecture room than last year, but still. And the same kind of topic, the future of energy. Uh, and I'll give you a brief, uh, relatively brief uh, history about what the energy can be like, energy sector and the energy world could be like towards 2050, and that's a long horizon. The uncertainties are big, and there are many uh, possible outcomes of that. And uh, we have constructed three possible outcomes, and I'll try to give you a flavor of all that. Uh, and I'm here now as the chief economist in the company, the editor of this uh, publication. And, uh, but I also work with the providing recommendations for prices that uh, our decision makers will use for, for um, investment decisions. And I'm also responsible for strategy in the mid and downstream part of Equinor. I'm probably going to say startle a couple of times, so I have to apologize for that. <laughs> so what will I do? I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our scenarios first, what drives them, uh, why we have them. Uh, then I'll try and share what we think is some common beliefs, common shared beliefs, where hopefully all of us can agree. And that serves as a starting point, both for more debate, uh, but also for, for looking at how the, what the scenarios have in terms of implications for those beliefs. So having gone through a couple of the results, some of the results here, then I'll give a couple of final messages as to how, how, how do the scenarios, uh, what, what, what type of implications do they have for these common beliefs. It's a global perspective, global presentation. I probably will not mention the UK, I have to apologize for that. I'll probably flip over the, the one EU slide I have in here, and I won't mention Norway. So when you're asked the question, in which direction is the energy world moving? Well, that depends. To, there's, it's impossible to give one single answer to that. It depends which window you look out of, where you are, what sector you're thinking about, and what assumptions you choose to put weight on. And if you're concerned with uh, the possibilities of getting energy-related CO2 emissions on a trajectory which might be consistent with climate targets, uh, then an optimistic outlook would be that you know, the electric vehicles, number of electric vehicles hit record levels last year. About a million new electric vehicles, about half of which were in China. Good news. Costs of EVs are coming down, and there's a likelihood that they will be competitive with the ICE engines, engine-driven cars, within the next decade, without subsidies. Car producers will have to produce a lot more of them, and there will be opportunities for consumers to actually choose them to big, much bigger numbers than today. Renewable electricity, cost reductions there as well. Record investments in wind and solar last year, 167 gigawatts put on ground to produce electricity. New record, very good news. Development is going in the right direction. On the other hand, energy demand is going up again and more, by more than previous years. Coal demand is going up, CO2 emissions are increasing after three flat years. At the moment, if the Chinese emissions develop as they are looking at the moment, 2018 might see 5% increase in Chinese CO2 emissions relative to 2017. Bad news for climate. 1.7 million barrels per day of oil demand increase last year. The energy content of 1.7 million barrels per day of oil is three times the energy, the electricity we potentially can produce from the record number of windmills and solar panels put on Earth last year. So it shows you a little bit of the scale of the challenge. On the geopolitical arena or the policy arena, uh, the development since Paris has basically been negative. We're still in a situation, or we're very much in a situation where key decision makers do not act as if we are all in the same boat. It's very difficult to get collective decisions to solve collective problems. We don't trust each other. We put in place sanctions with the countries and the people we don't like. So technology development is slower than it has to be. We don't trade necessarily on the basis of comparative advantage, but rather on the basis of protecting some of our own industries. That will lower economic growth, and it will probably lower the, op the, the ability of us all to solve the climate issue. So also on the policy side, we're not going in the right direction. The prevalence of conflicts around the world, the prevalence of sanctions, the prevalence of protectionism increasing is bad news for the ability to make uh, decisions that actually matter. So then, when you look out the window again and you try to speculate about the future, you can write three very different histories, at least, 
and we've made those three scenarios. Same names as last year, updated data, some updates of the assumptions, and some updates on methods as well. They are still called reform, renewal, and rivalry. The reform scenario is the central one. It's assuming that trends that we see both in terms of markets and technologies will continue to improve efficiency. It will continue to drive fuel mix changes. Uh, we think that all countries in that scenario will deliver on their pledges, the national de determined contributions for the climate agreement by 2025, 2030. After that, markets and technology will be the prime driver for more energy efficient development and more fuel changes. CO2 emissions, hardly budge. Basically stable, increase moderately to 2030 in that scenario, then moderately comes down to slightly below today's levels. So we need much more in order to be in a trajectory where the energy sector contributes to climate targets. Much more than the national pledges. And by the way, we're very far away from those pledges being a walk in the park. Then the renewal scenario is the scenario where we have assumed that we will reach CO2 levels from the energy sector that are consistent with a two degree target with slightly more than 50% probability. And then we've calculated our way back, a possible pathway. And that is definitely not a walk in the park. It's an enormously challenging proposition. What, what does that take? And I'll come back to that. But the main drivers in that scenario is technology and markets supplemented and promoted and driven by policy decisions, global collective mindset driving things like a pr proper price on carbon, fuel efficiency standards. We allow technologies to develop. We trade with, based on, on comparative advantage and carbon and not based on security of supply. That means that the countries that have growing energy demand and a lot of coal underneath their feet will not use that coal, but rather import technology to make themselves self-sufficient on renewable electricity and also import more gas in the case of the countries in Asia, for instance. The rivalry scenario assumes that we will continue to be in a situation where geopolitical volatility plays a role, at least on occasion or in cycles. Regional conflicts, uh, boom and bust cycles in the economy, uh, technology development that is much slower than in the other scenarios because of continued sanctions and lack of trust, lack of cooperation, cater for myself rather than my neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. In that scenario, GDP growth is lower, energy efficiency is much worse, and CO2 emissions go up more than in the other scenarios. Not a nice place to be, but we cannot exclude it. And frankly speaking, when you look out at the window, a lot of the polit political movements we see out there is conducive or consistent with that type of scenario. Probably won't last for 35 years, but anyway. These scenarios are relatively extreme archetypes of the assumptions we put in place when we make these scenarios. And they're all unlikely in that sense when you look at each of the figures, but they span out an outcome space of possible development that we think is relatively likely. So the common shared beliefs that I hope you can all agree on. We think global demand for energy services. So energy dependent goods, services and activities that require energy either in their production or their consumption will increase to 2050. Two and a half billion more people, four billion more middle class consumers, much more income much more GDP, much more demand for goods, services, and activities. 400 million people in India alone without access to electricity, they will demand electricity by 2050, in particular since they're eight times as rich as they, will, they are today. So the demand for energy services will grow. That does not necessarily mean that total primary energy demand will go up. And I'll come back to that. But it's very difficult to avoid it from growing. The world is undergoing an energy transition. We see signals of that in parts of the transportation sector, the parts of, of um, electricity sector. Uh, digitalization carries with it a lot of transitional changes, both on the supply and demand side of energy, but we don't see it all over the place. We see it in very few countries, few sectors, and the speed, scope, and scale is extremely uncertain. But things are happening. There is an energy transition ongoing. Large investments are needed in the energy system. That's the last belief. Not only in renewable electricity, grid lines, batteries, storages, demand management systems, et cetera, et cetera, but also for new investments in oil and gas, irrespective of scenario. And by the way, new investments in nuclear as well, if we're going to reach the two degree target. 
And I'll come back and try and prove for you that we need new investments in oil and gas as a, in particular. And I'll show you uh, some of the scales of the challenges in new renewables as well. So back to will energy demand necessarily grow? No. But if you look at what the drivers here, global economic level of income, GDP, we think in these scenarios that the economic growth will average somewhere between 1.9% per year globally in a rivalry scenario with an economic cycle, so it looks like a zigzag line in the left chart there, and 2.7% in the renewal case, very close to that in the reform case as well. So that by 2050, global GDP is between two times twice as large and two and a half times larger than today. That's a key driver for the demand for energy, but in particular for energy services. We will be two and a half billion more people, et cetera, et cetera. We will be smarter, more capital, more labor in some countries where there's still an underutilized labor force, in particular among women, will drive economic development. Will energy demand grow? That depends on the development in energy intensity, how efficient we can provide energy. The last 25 years, the average energy intensity improvement has been 0.9% per year, the white dots here globally. We're, we haven't decoupled GDP growth and energy demand growth, not at all. In some few countries, we see some of the signals, but not at all on a global level. But energy demand never grows as fast as GDP, if you like. Going forward, in a renewal case, we'll have to improve energy intensity improvement three times, 2.8% annual reduction in energy use per dollar of GDP. So that in 2050, energy demand is 6% lower than today. If you think that's impossible, and remember this is, this is one way of getting to the two degree trajectory of energy related CO2 emissions. If you think that's impossible, then you'll have to come up with another alternative. We think it's possible, but extremely challenging. Because this also caters for all our behavioral changes when something becomes more efficient. The cost of energy goes down for us as consumers when something becomes more efficient. And then the tendency is that we use more of it. Comfort factors. We reduce the temperature in our houses during the summer when we get a heat pump. Or we increase the temperature during the winter when we get a heat pump because it's cheaper. We drive more when the gasoline price goes down. We drive more when the car engine is more efficient. All those types of behavior is in here. The two other scenarios also deliver better improvements in energy intensity and significantly so in the reform case than history, but still delivers growing primary energy demand, 25 to 30 percent. The second thing that will happen is that we'll see significant changes in the fuel mix, global fuel mix, both on a primary energy level and also on a final energy level, final energy consumption level, uh, much more so than hist historically. The red here will become visible, not because Equinor has changed colors, but because the new renewables grow from something hardly visible today as a share of total primary energy demand. The electricity from windmills and, and solar panels are hardly visible. Going to 2050, in a renewal case, they will have to grow to 20% in order for us to be in a trajectory that is consistent with climate targets. Second message on this one, we've got to get coal demand out. 75% reduction, 50%, half of this is used in China alone. We have to get coal demand down. In this scenario, we have one and a half billion tons of carbon capture and storage. One reason we don't need more, that's an enormous challenge, by the way. If I have time, I'll come back to how enormous it is. And the reason we don't need more is that we have coal demand going down by 75%. And that's in spite of energy demand growing where coal is in ample supply in Asia, partly. Third message, electricity will grow. We will become more electric. We will not become electric. Elec electricity is today less than 20% than total final energy consumption. That will grow more rapidly almost twice as rapid in the renewal scenario as historically. And we will have 35% of our total final energy consumption being electricity in 2050. That's, we're more optimistic here now this year than we were last year. We see the potential for electricity growing faster. But still, two thirds of our total final energy consumption will not be electricity and therefore not a very good candidate for new renewables electricity. 
This is EU. I'll, I promise not to talk about EU, so I'll skip that. Uh, then on the energy transition and its impact on CO2 emissions, this is what I already said. This, the emissions in the reform and rivalry case continue to be much too high to be consistent with any kind of climate target in the Paris Agreement. And they continue to increase in the rivalry case in spite of lower GDP growth, but much lower efficiency and less fuel changes ensures that that grows. This is the renewal scenario. This is by design and not because it's easy. We have assumed it. 60% reduction in CO2 emissions, meaning we use 820 roughly billion tons of the carbon budget, if you like, out to 2050. And then we have something left and still be within a slightly higher than 50% probability of the two degree target, according to IPCC and IEA. What does that take? 80% reduction in emissions here in the OECD or EU or OECD Europe. 82% reduction in North America. 67% reduction in China. China's emissions today are four times what they were in 1990. They have to go down by two thirds and the economy continues to grow by 4% per year in that scenario. India, India is a tiny economy in CO2 terms. It's an enormous country, but it has an enormous amount of energy poor people and poor people. Going to 2050, the Indian emissions will have to go down. In spite of them going out of CO2 neutral, extremely polluting and unsustainable biomass to something else, in spite of the economy growing by seven to eight times, and in spite of providing energy to a lot of energy poor citizens, and having a lot of indigenous coal. If they achieve that, it's a massive achievement for all of us. And probably the thing we should do if we're really concerned about climate, is for every one of us to assist in that to happen any way we can. And not talk too much about crazily expensive, difficult emission reduction measures uh, in Europe. So what does all this do for oil and gas demand? That depends. Does oil demand grow or fall in these scenarios? Look at the, sec the left chart. That's changes in oil demand by sector by scenario. The transport sector is the key. In the renewal scenario, we have enormous electrification of transport. Light duty vehicles are in practice fully electrified by 2040. A lot of electricity in buses, a lot of electricity in trucks, much more efficient combustion engines. We fly three times as many airplanes and use less oil. We transport much more goods across the world in a much more efficient logistical process, using slightly more gas in shipping as well, and use less oil in shipping. So we deliver energy services with reducing oil demand in the transport sector by some 60, 65, 70%. In the other scenarios, the outcome is not as clear. For gas, whether gas demand grows or not depends on the de development in the power sector, in the electricity sector. In a renewal scenario, both the energy efficiency, not increasing electricity demand more, but, in but also the fantastic growth in new renewables in that scenario will contribute to a reduction in gas demand. Other sectors have different results. In both the reform and rivalry case, the, re the electricity demand for gas goes up. The third message in this chart is that there is one sector where demand grows in all scenarios with different amounts. That's the non-energy sector in IEA speak. That is the demand for oil and gas as feedstock in the petrochemical industry. So that's where we transform the hydrocarbons into something else and don't emit the CO2 in, the pro in that process with the ex if, uh, if we can decarbonize the energy use, transforming it. But we increase a potential pollution problem. We increase the need for recycling but we think it will continue to grow as people become richer, more middle class consumers will need stuff. We're gonna build 700 million more houses plus refurbish some billion houses as an example that needs insulation, air conditioners, batteries. We're gonna have a lot more cars, they're built of polymers, meeting rooms, office buildings, wall to wall carpets, tables, your kitchen, your cosmetics, your toothbrushes, your toothpaste, whatever. 
That's going to continue to increase that demand, we think, by different amounts, and also by more recycling limiting the growth. But still, it will be, in this case, it will be roughly one-third of that, that growth plus the existing amount is one-third of total oil demand by 2050. So then to the investment. What does this mean for the investments in the energy sector? And I'll go into oil, gas, and new renewables quickly. This is oil. A huge range in oil demand by 2050. A very bad prediction for a chief economist. I'm sorry. Either 59 million barrels per day in the two degree scenario or 122 in a robbery case. But if you look at the lower of those numbers, this is, we reached a peak very early in the 2020s. So things have to happen very quickly. It's growing as we speak, right? And it starts a relatively solid decline towards 2050. If we stopped doing anything but maintaining existing production facilities, we fired all our explorationists, stopped using our brains in increasing oil recovery, and stopped using money in increasing oil recovery, stopped using money in, in moving resources into reserves, production supply, supply of oil would fall somewhere between 3 and 6% per year. We lose the equivalent of the total US shale production every year if we don't do anything, we think. Roughly that. Meaning that when we come out here, we might need four new Saudi Arabias in new oil production. And if you accumulate that range, we might need 480 billion barrels of oil by 2050 from something that doesn't deliver today. That's a lot. If you wonder whether 400, very few of us have a relationship to billion barrels, and we have 480 of them. It's 30% more than the total accumulated supply from OPEC over the last 35 years. It's an enormous challenge. And in particular in the investment climate that the IOCs are facing at the moment and the NOCs, the uncertainty about the future of the business, et cetera, et cetera. Will we invest sufficient amounts to satisfy demand in a two degree target is the relevant question. If you believe in another scenario, the challenge in terms of investments is even higher. Do you think oil is a problem? This is gas. Much better prediction, if you like, or less, probably much worse, but less variation. The gap is bigger, relatively speaking. It's probably easier to pinpoint where that gas is. The resources are there, so they are for, for oil, not the right quality for oil. But it's more difficult to make gas profitable for an international oil company, or for any oil company, because of the much longer plateau and the more, higher capital requirements. And we need 71 trillion cubic meters, 71,000 billion cubic meters. We don't have a good relation to that either, but that is 60% more than the combined production of the United States, Russia, and the Middle East for the last 35 years. That contains the four largest gas producers in the world, plus some. That's new gas, something that requires money and brain to be delivered to the markets and infrastructure. In addition, Enormous requirements for investments in wind, solar, some geothermal, and then also the, all the storages and storage facilities and infrastructures associated with that. And as an example, what, what do we think? Well, this is the capacity additions for some example years. This is the record capacity put on, on Earth last year, 167 gigawatts. So going forward, we think we will increase the capacity by increasing amounts every year in the reform case and in the renewal case, not in the robbery case until the end of the period. So that will go up. But as this industry grows bigger and older, an increasing challenge will be that we have to replace old windmills and solar panels. We think they live by, we assume here, 25 year lifetime. So that by 2050, we have to, in the renewal case, we have to put on Earth 350 gigawatts of new investments just to replace something that goes out. And then we think we're going to invest on top of that. In the renewal case, we have, at the end of the period, 3,944 gigawatts of windmills alone on Earth. If you assume that that is produced evenly over a 20-year period, and you use the ratio between our most of weight versus capacity, of our, our most modern high wind windmills, the floating windmills that we're now putting in place in Scotland, the newest version of those. 
producing those 39, 44 gigawatts evenly over a 20 year period is equal to 15 to 20 percent of the total steel production capacity in, in, the, in the world. So the demand for resources and minerals in this industry will also become an interesting add-on to opportunities for the steel industry and the concrete industry. And then you can add on the batteries. Here we have just added up to 2030, 35 doubling of the need for deliveries of batteries in the car sector alone in that scenario. Uh, the resources are there, it's going to come there, but the problem is whether we will increase the supply capacity sufficiently quickly. There are waiting lines for months now on plug-in hybrids in the one country in the world where you can see a lot of electric vehicles. I promise not to mention my home country, but I did. And so it's not about resources, but it's about investing in capacity to actually deliver the materials and the, and the batteries. It's going to be a challenge, but it has to happen. And we think it's possible. So then to conclude, it's not a given that global energy demand will grow, even though we think energy related services, the demand for those will grow. But it's going to be an enormous challenge. It requires a lot of changes in our energy efficiency developments if it's not going to grow. And the energy transition, if we're serious about climate targets, that has to speed up both in speed, in scale, and in scope. And there's a huge need for investments across the energy spectrum, irrespective of scenario. Thank you. And then uh, <laughs> Hilde will talk about our Hilde, we'll talk about our uh, climate roadmap and give you an update on that. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Like that. You have the first page. Here. Very good. So we've heard about uh, all the uncertainty in the energy markets going forward and uh, how we should be prepared for surprises and uh, that the energy uh, scenarios is really, really complex and uncertain. And of course, for us as a company, the question is then, how do we respond? How do we navigate in this very complex uh, terrain? And we have really found our response in our corporate strategy that was launched last year. We have three pillars in that strategy. It's always safe, high value and low carbon. And we believe that's a very good starting point for us as a company to really be able to handle all kinds of energy futures. And this is also why we have set an ambition to develop into a broad energy company. Because the energy transition, some see that as a threat, but we actually think there is a lot of opportunity in energy transition. We think there is opportunity for our oil and gas business and also for our new energy solutions business. We come from a great starting point. Uh, we are actually a world leader in our industry in carbon efficiency. And uh, this is something we think will become even more important going forward. Because even though there's a lot of uncertainty around the scale and the speed and uh, pace of the energy transition, we do believe that the overall direction is quite clear. We think that uh, the energy transition is here to stay and the future will be lower carbon than it is today. The question is, is the pace. So for us, we really believe in a lower carbon competitive advantage. And that's what we're trying to build with our climate roadmap. And I know that was presented to you last year. Our climate roadmap can very shortly be summed up as uh, reduce emissions, growing new energy solutions and be transparent and stress test our portfolio on a regular basis. Because within, low, uh, within oil and gas, we do see uh, potential for growth. Eric has, uh, seen, has already explained that there is continued demand for oil and gas also in low carbon scenarios, in two degree scenarios. But it does matter what kind of fossil fuels and what kind of resources we develop going forward. So that's why we have said that going forward, we will not uh, explore for heavy oil, for example. We have made divestments from, uh, from oil sands and we've set a clear target to both improve our current operations by reducing CO2 emissions there, but also taking CO2 into account when we do business development and mergers and acquisitions, etc. So really shaping a future portfolio that is both low carbon but also high value. 
with a low break even. We think that will be an advantage in, in a more carbon constrained uh, world. Then we do believe that there is a lot of opportunity for, uh, for renewables and new energy solutions. And uh, we've started on that journey and made some significant uh, investments over the past few years. We've indicated as part of our climate roadmap that new energy solutions might be around 15 to 20% of our annual CAPEX by 2030. And that's quite a substantial number. That is, of course, uh, dependent on us being able to continue to find really attractive opportunities and to develop them. But so far, we're on track also on that, uh, that ambition. We're also involved in, uh, in CCS, a very exciting project, uh, pilot project in, in Norway, looking at how CCS can be used uh, to capture uh, carbon from industries, from other industries than our own, uh, industries that have carbon as a byproduct. So that's also something we're working on in the research and development and new energy solutions part of, of the business. A very important part of our climate roadmap is also how we work internally. And we've worked very systematically on setting up key performance indicators, monitoring reports, business areas have their own roadmaps that's targeted towards the, their business, uh, and also following up on a regular basis how we actually perform. But we're also trying to invite all our employees to really engage in, in climate because we think there is a lot of competence and skill and technology available there. And we want our employees to use their competence to actually identify opportunities in, in the current portfolio. And even though we already come from a position where we have around half the, the emissions per barrel when we produce oil and gas compared to the industry average, we still see potential for improvement. We set a target to have eight kilograms per barrel in 2030. We were in, at 10 uh, one year ago and, and we achieved nine kilograms this year. So on the right track. But we're also working on these small energy efficiency projects that we've actually worked on since 2000, year 2000 very systematically. We've had over 300 of those uh, energy efficiency programs and our uh, engineers are working very hard to identify new opportunities because this is more about culture and awareness and, uh, and uh, operational efficiency rather than necessarily the very big investments. Many of these projects are, they have a good, uh, they make sense economically, they have a short payback time, but you really need quite a lot of them to, uh, to make a substantial impact. So last year we were able to achieve 10% of our 2030 ambition of, uh, of uh, 3 million tons of CO2 saved. And one of the main contributors there was our Hammerfest LNG factory. Now that's in the very north uh, of Norway, where they used a planned maintenance period to actually very systematically look for opportunities from changing uh, light bulbs to, uh, to shutting down one of the gas turbines. So really a broad range of small energy efficiency measures that really adds up. And for this, they were awarded also with the CEO Sustainability Award, because this is really part of the idea of the identity of the, of the company on, and on the top management's uh, agenda. We do believe that natural gas is a very important part of, uh, of the climate solution, and it is of all uh, low carbon uh, scenarios. But it is important that we're able to manage the methane emissions that are associated with, uh, with natural gas. And we've worked quite systematically the uh, past few years on really making sure that we have the correct baseline for our na natural gas. We've worked with the Norwegian authorities, with various research um, authorities, and we've also worked with Imperial College on some of these uh, studies to find out how much methane is leaked throughout the value chain when we produce and, uh, and transport, distribute uh, gas until the final user. Because there is a fear that if uh, fugitive methane leakages from, from gas surpass a certain limit, that the climate benefit gas has compared to gold could be compromised. Now that magic threshold, the most conservative estimate is around 3%. Uh, and uh, our gas, as you can see here, uh, our gas to Europe is around 0 0.2, and that's to the door in UK and, and uh, Germany. And uh, for the US, it's slightly higher, around 
0.8%, but still really far below any of the estimates that we have heard and uh, that are out there. So we're working with, uh, and we're also uh, published a report on this that's available on our, uh, on our website. And we use technologies such as drones over flights uh, to, to actually map emissions and, and uh, get a good overview of, uh, of this. New energy solutions is also a very important part of our uh, response to, uh, to energy transition. Uh, we do see great opportunities here and uh, indeed gas and, new and, uh, and renewables has also been a very important part of, uh, of uh, Britain's and UK's uh, climate, uh, climate work so far. And we learned earlier this year that uh, the UK now has the lowest emissions in around 120 or 130 years. And at Aquinor, we're actually quite proud that uh, Norwegian gas and uh, some of our renewables projects have contributed to, to achieving this, that actually emissions are starting to go the right way. So this 2017 was a really exciting year. Uh, we had High Wind Scotland, the first uh, floating offshore wind park of some size was opened up in Scotland. And floating offshore wind is uh, it's exciting because it enables us to look at opportunities also at greater depth than before, which could open up new countries, etc. Uh, but it's still a bit less mature than the bottom fixed uh, offshore wind parks, which we have more of. So we've now reached uh, a level of being able to supply around 750,000 households in the UK with the wind from our uh, renewable energy parks. And we are, of course, working on future opportunities as, uh, as well. Amongst them, one uh, potential wind park outside of uh, Manhattan. Uh, we're also looking at opportunities in Poland, for example. So these are some examples of what we're doing within new energy solutions. And we also have some exciting opportunities that we're looking at further into the horizon, for example, around hydrogen. So why does this make us uh, more uh, resilient? We think that working on both the new energy solutions opportunities, but also our oil and gas uh, portfolio, really enables us to, to capture value going forward. We get more diversified. That makes us a bit more resilient towards uh, potential changes in oil and gas uh, prices. Uh, but we've also lived for a very long time with quite a high carbon price in Norway, for example. So two thirds of our portfolio is already subject to, to the Norwegian CO2 tax and uh, EU ETS. Uh, so we actually pay around $60 per ton for this. So we've been asked by many of our investors uh, whether there is a risk of stranded assets in our portfolio, for example, and how big is that risk, etc. And three years in a row now, we have been uh, conducting what we call a stress test against external energy scenarios. For this, we don't use our own scenarios, and that's because uh, the investors specifically have asked us to use uh, scenarios that they can use for comparison and benchmarking towards the others, but we use the International Energy Agency's uh, range of scenarios to look at how we perform in those scenarios. And uh, the sustainable development scenario here is uh, the most recent IEA two degree uh, scenario. There we see that we have a slight sort of downside compared to our own uh, estimates, uh, our own estimates around uh, net present value. That does not mean that those projects are not profitable. It's just less than what we are expecting. But what we're really doing in this test is a quite simple test against the oil and gas prices and the carbon prices in the scenarios outlined here. So for example, in this sustainable development scenario, we're testing our portfolio against a future price of $140 per, per ton, which is nowhere near <laughs> where we are uh, today. But to ensure that we are resilient and prepared for various energy futures, we do, for example, apply a 50 US dollar price on carbon to every, every project in our portfolio. And we test it against various break-evens and, and, uh, and oil and gas uh, prices. While this, uh, this stress test uh, always is, is very uh, interesting to look at, we think it's important that we understand that, of course, 
we will adapt as a company. If the world changes significantly, we will not just sit there and uh, do nothing. We actually have a lot of opportunity to adapt our portfolio, to grow more in new energy solutions if we see potential for that, to adjust our oil and gas uh, investments. And this flexibility that we have going forward is really some of the key to, to managing the, the uncertainty in the energy markets. A lot of our projects are still under develop, uh, development and we have the freedom going forward to really choose the best investments. So based on this, we think that we are actually quite well prepared. We do not have all the answers. We will probably be surprised, uh, but we think our strategy provides a really good starting point for, uh, for energy transition. Thank you. So I think... I think with that, we've just opened up for, uh, for yeah, some yeah. questions. So, um, yeah. I'd just like to thank yes. Hilda and Eric for a very interesting talk. And um, what we'll do is we'll take some questions now from the audience. If you could wait till the microphone gets to you, which is the one in my hand. And also, could you keep it to actually questions? That would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, so who's first? And I'll, I'll let Eric and Hilda point out who they want. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much to share your plans. I would like to know if you have a plan of the technologies that can be direct transfer from the oil and gas industry to these renewable. It's like, a, are you planning to do a recycling of your technologies and the actual one to the renewable? We well, part of what we're, <laughs> one of the reasons why we are doing offshore wind a lot is that we can apply not only the technologies, but the skills that we have in offshore uh, oil and gas production to some of the key challenges we have in offshore wind. Things like maintenance programs, handling things in big waves, uh, flying people in and out, safety. Uh, safety, moving big installations, lifting them in place, towing them. So all those types of skill sets is very conducive and very, very close to what we're actually having a 40 year experience of handling on the Norwegian continental shelf and elsewhere. Going forward, things like digitalization will probably be s technologies and skill set that will apply all over the energy spectrum. And, and we are doing it now on oil and gas and exploration and all that, and we will increasingly do that as well on, on electricity. There's one down here as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex Martinez from Energy Intelligence. Um, uh, thank you very much for your uh, talks today. Um, I had a couple of quick questions, one of them perhaps more for Eric. Um, I was wondering how you think the short-term factors which you mentioned looking at the oil and gas markets, uh, in particular higher prices, stronger demand at the moment, uh, are in your view likely to shape the longer-term trajectory uh, and development of uh, investment uh, moving away from those sectors. So, in other words, will those short-term uh, stronger demand encourage investment or will the long-term uh, potential downside in demand discourage investment at the same time? Um, and a quick, oh, I had a quick second question, um, which was on the question of setting targets relating to emissions. Um, my understanding is the targets that Equinor has set were for uh, primarily to emissions from the company as own operations itself. Um, some other companies, I think Shell in particular, have looked for uh, targets relating to em emissions from uh, the company's products as they're sold over a longer term as well. Is that something you've been looking at? Thank you. Okay, I'll do the first question. Yeah. Hilda will do the second. Uh, no, I, well, f first of all, I think that uh, the Increase we've seen in the, in particular in the oil price over the last uh, year or so, year a couple of years, uh, is a re partly a reflection of expected changes or expected consequences of growing demand in a situation where the industry didn't invest sufficient sufficiently, and and uh, the fundamentals indicate a you know would indicate a price roughly at today's levels so or slightly lower, but uh, but uh, paper markets have driven the price up as they see shortage storages coming down realizing that there's a very low level of spare capacity there, 
Uh, we have our, our uh, share of geopolitical concerns, we have our share of supply disruption, so the market gets increasingly worried. And then to what extent we'll actually be able to balance the markets and deliver sufficient amounts of oil and gas going forward then depends on how much demand grows and how much new investments we'll get. And, the, and currently, both because of the industry's ability to get costs down, we're talking about, in our case, we're talking about break-even prices for our future portfolio now coming down to $21 a barrel for the, one, the investments that we will make over the next four or five years. That's compared to what we had four or five years back when the average was around 70. So the industry has developed significantly much lower cost solutions. That is conducive to us investing slightly more. Uh, and then, of course, the prices are an indication that the demand is there for, for a while. But then, of course, what is balancing that is a worry that you know, what happens to the market when and if demand peaks and when? What happens to the market if we get increasing fuel efficiency standards or increasing willingness to, to ban exploration for new resources, et cetera? So there's, a, there's that balance there. And, uh, and I didn't say anything about that, but of course a world where demand peaks, like in the, in the renewal scenario, but then with, still with enormous need for investments, that's a very different market history than any other commodity has been in ever, at, at least in terms of the size of this market as well. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, time to see the, how, how does different oil companies and, and oil owning countries strategically adapt to such a situation. But the investment needs are there. Yeah, so uh, on the question of uh, emission reductions, we have only set uh, emission reduction targets for our own uh, operations. Uh, we do follow this polluter pays principle and, and uh, our primary concern is, uh, is the emissions we have uh, as a company. So that's where we're focusing. Um, we do not have a lot of sort of downstream business either. So it's not very easy for us perhaps to, to go in, the, in another direction. That being said, we do, for example, work on uh, hydrogen projects and, and CCS. Uh, I mentioned this uh, pilot going on in, in Norway where you actually capture and, or store CO2 from other parties if, if it succeeds. Uh, that would not be visible in, in our emissions uh, sheet, so to say, because that would be emission reductions for other companies. Uh, and, and the same with, uh, with potential hydrogen. So we're working on solutions for products through our ambition in R&D and also this uh, ambition to scale up new energy solutions, but not as an emission reduction target. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, thanks a lot uh, for your interesting presentation. Um, I basically have two small questions. Uh, I'm, I'm Karl Kronenberg, EBRD, uh, one for Eric and one for Hilde. Uh, the one for Eric, um, I work for the EBRD. It's an, financial sector. Um, we do a lot of work at the moment on, well, basically transparency, the TCFD, yeah, basi basically disclosure of financial risks. If I would invest in Equinor, would that be on my list of high risk, yeah, both from a transitional point of view and from a physical planet point of view? Um, and the second question for, for Hilde is, um, if he would invest in um, well, if you would apply a carbon price or a carbon tax, uh, should you not also include the upstream emissions from natural gas, specifically if you lose a lot of gas coming from Russia, we can have 2% methane emissions. Is that something that you should include in your, in your analysis or in your ETS or taxation system? Yeah, on the, on the investment risks, uh, you ask me whether Equinor would be a high risk investment. No, <laughs> and the disclosure shows it, right? Why not? <laughs> first of all, in the stress test. First of all, there's a big uh, there's first of all there's a big difference between I mean all the different types of risks that are in the TCFD the recommendations is something that we're looking at, and and uh, I, I challenge also that I mean you sh we should apply those risks to many other industries than the energy sector, by the way, and there's a difference between climate risks and transition risks and policy risks and price risks. A lot of the risks that we're handling in terms of, and have to handle in terms of transition risks are translated into price risks or the risks of a lower market for our products. That is something that we handle every day and we've done for decades. Um, also the, the, um, 
the alternative, to the extent that you think there is a need for energy, then investments in energy across the board is something that prob would probably be uh, a smart thing to do. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, our ability to adapt the portfolio. We will probably realize at some point whether we are in the renewal scenario or the SDS scenario or not. Uh, and then we will have the ability to adapt these uh, TFC tests that we run. They don't account, or they don't account for that possibility. Uh, so we can adapt the portfolio. Um, and what's the alternative? Google, maybe. That's overpriced already. Tesla, <laughs> way above. It's too expensive. And which other sector has provided consistent dividends increasingly so since 19, 1940s? Um, but also on a, on a serious note, I would be a bit careful looking at price volatility, not only for oil and gas, but just think about the price of electricity in the future where, in our scenario, we have 60% of the electricity generated in a renewal scenario in Europe coming from windmills and solar panels. What's the volatility in electricity markets today? What is it in the future? What's the average level of electricity prices in a situation where half the electricity is produced by something that doesn't cost, cost anything to produce? What are the regulatory risks about future regulation of electricity markets if you want to go into somebody who is a sole investor in renewable electricity. So use a portfolio perspective and then look at who is uh, handling this and then uh, it's a nice proposition. Very well, so to your question around uh, methane, I think um, the price, uh, the internal carbon price that we use of $50 everywhere, apart from the countries where it's actually higher <laughs> today, uh, that accounts in a way it's a sort of proxy for all kinds of, uh, of carbon costs and in some countries it's perhaps more likely that those will be methane related costs but and, and in general you just tr uh, translate methane uh, to CO2 equivalents and you sort of pay a carbon tax uh, it's, that is corresponding to that. For, for the Equinor uh, our methane emissions are 4% of our total greenhouse gas emissions, so it's really not the sort of key issue. And you asked about this, uh, the gas to, we deliver to Europe, our part of those emissions are below 0.02%. So it really, and, and they're already accounted for and paid for. So, so for us, I would really actually say that, you know, meth despite all the talk, methane is very important. It's very important on a global scale, but uh, the type of pipelines, etc., we have are uh, are very robust and it's not really not the issue from a risk yeah, perspective. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, Francis Morris Jones with the Oil and Gas Authority. I wanted to ask two quick questions. One is, is the carbon price that you mentioned one that would be a break even for your CCS project or do you need a, a higher carbon price? And the other is, what um, thinking have you done on, you talk about transfer of technologies between um, oil and gas and renewables, but what about um, uh, synergies between the two businesses and reuse of infrastructure? What, th what criteria would you apply to that? What thinking have you done on that? Thank you. Yeah, on. Let's go to on. I take the first one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, on, on what carbon price we need to make carbon capture and storage uh, projects fly, that depends on the, very much on the project itself. Uh, and the early projects need more than the later, the, and the smaller projects need more than the larger ones. Uh, the projects that are close to a storage facility need less than than uh, than the ones that are further away. So the, and and this. So and, and on uh, the pilot that we're talking about now doesn't fly at $50 per ton. Doesn't fly at the Norwegian CO2 tax either. Uh, and in particular, the, it's not us, that, but it's, it's, the, it's the industrial facilities that need support to develop these types of concepts and projects. Uh, as an example of a project that we did in 19, ni early 90s, the, 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 the pre-combustion car uh, carbon capture at the Sleipner field, which is the biggest we have in Norway, uh, that was made profitable and possible by a CO2 tax, which is higher than the $50 well, it was around $50 per ton, and we had what we had then. 
So that, that's an example of something that was made profitable with that kind of tax. Uh, but that, uh, that was a specific reason. It's not post-combustion, it's pre-combustion. It's uh, up on top of the storage facility. Uh, and you had all the infrastructure available, more or less, to, to put it down in. So, so that's, uh, so, uh, no, and, and the sad story about carbon capture and storage is that uh, that's the technology here that, that, need, that is in urgent need of a carbon price because it's the revenue, if you like, the avoidance of a future carbon tax is the re only source of revenue for a project like that uh, in general. And uh, the more we, the faster the fantastic development in renewable electricity goes, in a sense, the more it undermines the carbon the capture and storage projects in, in a quota system, unless you have a tax that's stable because it undermines the price. So there's something also about that. On the question of combination, we are looking into very sort of concrete opportunities at the uh, Norwegian continental shelf, potentially using offshore wind as uh, partly a solution for electrification for some, uh, some newer fields. So there are some discussions there, but I think that's, that's all we can say, but definitely, yeah. Mm. I think it's, uh, yeah. Graham Bennett from DMVGL. Thank you very much for your presentation, but also thanks to the team behind it for putting the, the work in to do the reports. And thanks to your guys for having a competing scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Turning to that question, no, uh, seriously. Um, in, your, in all three scenarios, you still show quite a, a, a bullish outlook for, for oil in particular, whether that's 25 to 30% of, of demand. Um, in a scenario where you're also seeing a lot of rise of battery vehicles, we see phase out of potentially marine fuel, possible aviation switch to electric aeroplanes. We've just seen them no. in, in Norway <laughs> as well. But the, the, the challenge going forward, even if you see it, a, a feed into increased petrochemicals, is in terms of refinery configurations. Do you see a lot of investment needed in refineries to change the configuration away from producing petroleum and distillates and, and um, diesel? to producing just the higher end products to go into a petrochemical feedstock? Yeah, f f first, well, I mean, first of all, to the, I wouldn't characterize uh, a peak oil demand by 2030 and a reduction to 59 million barrels per day as a bullish scenario for oil demand. And, uh, and uh, your own scenario is, uh, is there. Uh, where you're bullish is in, in the overall growth in electricity. <laughs> Goes all the way up, and I don't know where you're gonna get all the steel from. Um, but uh, and uh, of, yeah, what we will, well, what we have done in, uh, also now this year, we, we don't have our, our modeling capabilities on extremely granular details on the petroleum products per region and per refinery is a, is relatively limited, and I would need a much larger staff to do that. But we, what we have done this year is we looked at what the scenarios imply for for uh, demand for different types of oil products. That gives some input to a discussion on where the refinery sector will have to go. And, and also some interesting potential market implications. We're going to have a sea of diesel right, in the renewal scenario, in particular when, when the cities of London, Hamburg, and Paris are banning diesel vehicles, uh, and, and then exacerbated later on by, the, by us take, I mean, we have, in the renewal scenario, we have all cars being electric by 2040, roughly. So, so that, that then is a cheap feedstock for something, but it's also, Needs, we need reinvestments or reconfigurations of the refineries, and, and that's going to happen. Um, but it will cost money, and it will be a source of friction and inflexibility and sources of volatility in the markets. Uh, we'll also have to, we ha what we have to think about here is that the, also the flows of, of petroleum products, is they are changing as we speak. And, and uh, most of the, any growth in refineries, and probably most of the growth in the petrochemical industry is gonna take place East of, uh, east of the Gulf of, or the Strait of Hormuz. And that's not happening at, sufficiently as we speak, and we're gonna phase out refineries in, in uh, Europe and partly in North America. So all that will happen. This is not a given constraint, but it is something that requires investments and will require friction, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, uh, and uh, if you pair that with the potential likelihood that most of the new oil is relatively heavy and sour. Talk, think about Venezuela. Think most of the oil resources, identified oil resources in the world, are heavy and sour. And my petrochemical colleague says it doesn't matter if you're heavy as long as you're sweet. And I like that very much. But, 
but the also for oil. So, so if we have a heavy sour crude slate coming out of Venezuela or Western Canada, and then refineries need to end up with all these light end products for aviation, we're not going to have a lot of electric planes in the world, uh, and so gasoline, not diesel, petrochemicals. It's a it's a big challenge. And, and uh, that's also a part of the steel requirements that, that are <laughs> part of this equation. Right? Yeah. Hmm. This, I think you were first, hmm. and then you. I'm also, actually, I'm going to play villain, and we've only got time for one more. One more. Sorry about that, but I'm sure Hilda and Eric will stick around a bit longer. But I will okay, remember. one more. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Pratima Rangarajan, OGCI Climate Investments. Uh, you spoke about India and you talked about China and the growth scenarios for those countries, they're pretty large in terms of demand. What are the ideas for, you know, we talk a lot about Europe and North America, but uh, the global growth, what do we, you know, did we model different scenarios for how they get their, their emissions down? Mm. And how we handle their growth and still be sustainable? Yeah, well, first of all, they will handle it themselves, and uh, they are together two point what three three billion people uh, by 2050, and they're as smart as us. So, so that most of the technology solutions for the world will come out of those countries, and then and in addition, so um, what we and the countries around uh, what we foresee in the case of China is that the the significant drive they've had towards renewables until a couple of weeks ago when they told us that they would face back the solar subsidies would drive that development enormously. So, and they will have 50% of their electricity come out of solar and wind facilities in the renewal scenario. Today, six, about 70% of their electricity comes out of coal. So it's an enormous challenge. Um, all, and exactly how is impossible to identify and where. Uh, we talk a lot about decentralized electricity being the solution for emerging economies. They will skip our trunk lines, centralized and so on. That will take place somewhere uh, where, the, where, the, where, the, where the conditions are, are, are favorable for those types of investments. But in, in huge cities, which they have a lot of, and they're gonna have 10 to 20, 10 million people cities, new, both in China and possibly in India as well, the conditions for decentralized solar power are not ideal. So you have to have some centralized, maybe around the cities and so on, because the, the, there's not enough roof, rooftops per capita. There are not enough room for cars per capita to have the batteries per capita that you need for the decentralized. And by the way, decentralized is better for light bulbs and, and, and slow heating than for induction ovens and uh, charging your Tesla, which is what we tend to do when we have a lot of electricity like we do in Norway. So we need larger capacities. That will have to ha take place in the cities. Um, one of the extra challenges in India is that they have to do the same thing China did in the 70s, which was go out of extremely polluting biomass that doesn't produce electricity, but it produces uh, cooking and heating possibilities with an enormous pollution. Ma main reason why the Indian cities are more polluted than anywhere else in the world. And they have to replace that not by coal, which is what the Chinese did and electrify their population, but they have to replace it by something else. So in that sense, they have to jump over coal, do gas and new renewables and nuclear. By the way, we're gonna have much more nuclear also, also in China and India going forward. And um, it's one, solving that problem and thinking about how that can be done is one of the reasons why the renewal scenario is not likely at all. It's possible but it's not realistic in the sense of being probable. It's realistic in the sense of being, we hope, credible, or at least plausible. But uh, so, and, and, and we have to get at it. We have to start doing it. And, 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 and if we can get anywhere on that road, uh, that's good. Even if we don't get all the way there. So it's, uh, so, uh, and uh, we should all, we should all think about how, how that can most likely happen. The rich countries of the world that possess a lot of gas should seriously consider spending money giving that gas to somebody whose alternative is to utilize your own coal resources. That's probably money well spent compared to, this is extremely politically incorrect, but it's, uh, 
probably money well spent for a government that has enough money, uh, rather than look for very expensive but minor emission reduction measures in your own country, if you think about the global challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.